We're excited to welcome our opening keynote speaker, Professor Matthew Gilliland, Director of the Weight Research Institute, University of Adelheide, and Director of the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence in Plants for Space. He will speak on the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence in Plants for Space that aims to create on-demand, zero-waste, high-efficiency plants and plant products to address brand challenges in sustainability for space and on Earth. Please welcome Professor Gilliland. Thank you for having me today. And I'd like to uh, first start by acknowledging the traditional lands of the Ghana people, the land where I work, live and play, and also extend that acknowledgement to all First Nations people on the call. And acknowledge the deep connection that uh, many of the traditional owners have with both the land but also the the stars which they collectively know as country and one of the the great initiatives in our programs is to is to uh, look at the stars and to work with indigenous groups that have used the stars for many many years to make sense of their past and also to guide the future to work with them to inspire a new generation to to plot a new journey in the stars in years to come so what will i be talking about uh, to you today well i'll be talking about our initiative which is going to run over the in the first instance, at least for the first eight years um, following. And we will be linking with the Artemis missions, which plan to put the first woman and the first person of color on the moon by 2030, and to develop the technologies for humans to venture to Mars for the first time and to return to Earth in the 2040s. And this represents a, a three year round trip, a nine month voyage to Mars, which to keep people alive for that period of time is currently impossible. So what I mean by that, obviously, we have very good and well developed technologies for voyaging to Mars already. So the, the rocket technologies, we already have rovers on Mars, we already have copters on Mars. But the, the technology to keep people alive to sustain humans so they can survive and thrive thrive deep in space are currently not where they need to be and the kinds of technologies that we're talking about with this ultimately closed system we have to take everything with us to to survive and thrive out there can really impact us on earth to improve sustainability of certain practices particularly around agriculture and particularly around the on-demand uh, supply of medicines and materials so we've developed over the past three or four years with a number of collaborators, which I'll begin to outline through this presentation, linking many of the skill sets around the world in this endeavor, funded initially by the Australian Research Council, and we've called it Plants for Space. Now, one of our partners is NASA, and they visited recently. When I say they visited, that's the administrator and deputy administrator to uh, tour the facilities when they, they came to, to Australia. And maybe it's best described, and hopefully you can hear this audio <laughs> um, in the next slide, that uh, talks a little bit about what we're doing. So that was uh, Deputy, Direct, uh, Deputy Administrator Colonel Pamela Malroy outlining some of the, the links that we have with the Artemis programs of NASA. And our programs are really to enable human deep space exploration, but also to deliver those on Earth in, uh, improvements in sustainability that I was talking about, particularly in plant and food redesign. We are a virtual center. We are funded initially 
uh, with a presence of about 90 million Australian uh, dollars. That's cash and in kind. And as I said, we're virtual, so we are not spending on infrastructure in terms of buildings. We're linking a number of universities. We're multinodal. We span Australia, but also internationally with our partners. So who are our foundational partners? And these are some of the skill sets. We are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And we span five Australian foundational universities. So based in Victoria, in South Australia and in Western Australia. We have a number of international partner universities, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, ETH, Zurich, University of Cambridge, for instance. We have space agencies and foundational partners that work in new space, such as Axiom, which are currently uh, developing the, the new space station or one of the space stations to replace the International Space Station, as well as NASA and the Australian Space Agency. We have technology partners in controlled environment agriculture. We have technology providers, so all the omics you can think of. And we also have defense, a partner, obviously, with the AUKUS agreements and the requirement now that uh, the Australian Defense Force are going nuclear, that the only reason that people need to go into port is for food and for psychological uh, reasons, obviously then there's a great interest in developing these technologies to extend the duration of missions, as well as a massive program in education and inspiration of the next generation. So here we are on Mars in the, the 2040s. This is obviously just a, a mock-up of what we think that it might look like with humans venturing there. And I'll just run you through some of the technologies we're working with the kinds of innovations that we'll need to survive and thrive deep in space. Plants are the foundation of all life on Earth. They're the base material for our, for our ecological web, and they'll be the foundation of, of life in space, just as they are here on Earth. And we'll be developing plants that they can grow optimally in conditions that they have not evolved to grow in. So obviously plants have evolved to survive the worst day of their life or the worst week of their life, be that drought, be that heat waves, be that uh, flooding, etc. They're not evolved to grow extremely efficiently in controlled environments where we can extend photo period to constant, you know, 24 hours a day, where we can have constant temperature, optimal nutrients. And the kinds of crops that we can grow in controlled environments are very limited at the moment, successfully, and we'll be working on adapting these plants for these environments so we can extend, extend the range that we can grow. Processing these plants into multiple flavors and textures so crew can maintain an interest in eating. We'll be working on the psychology of teams, so how they interact with the, the food forms, how they interact with the technologies, the plant growth facilities, etc. The on-demand production piece. So the ability to make medicines and materials on demand within hours to days of the requirement. Obviously, we cannot wait that nine month trip that will be required for delivery from Earth. We have to have remote production facilities that are on demand. I've talked about the closed system of space. Obviously, recycling and reusing every single molecule is very important. So one of the things that we'll be working on is zero waste. And the legal uh, and policy frameworks are very important. There's no point starting research programs without first that framework working towards being able to use them and also the, the ability to, for these technologies to be taken up later. So we're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of the state of art of many of these things. We have learnings that we need to make, and that's why this investment over the next eight to 10 years is required to develop these technologies. And we'll be centered around four missions, and I've talked a little bit about these, and I'll just outline them again. So our first mission is zero waste plants optimized for controlled environments. The next is complete nutrition via plant-based sources. 
Then we have the on-demand bioresource production mission. And then a very large program in future ready workforce and society. And that's about inspiring the next generation and inspiring this generation, in fact. So interacting with the public, making our graduates industry ready, and also inspiring the school kids so they can uh, stem the pipeline of what's required to, to build both the biomanufacturing and agricultural industries on earth, but also to serve the Artemis missions. So just I'll outline some of the areas that we'll be working on. So the legal and ethical frameworks and those around biosecurity, obviously we need to protect both the, uh, the astronauts up there and also prevent contamination from coming back down to earth, but also contamination of planetary bodies and, um, and space in general. So we need uh, to look at the legal and policy frameworks around that. We also need to look at legal reforms to enable this massive growth that's required in the biomanufacturing industry that can aid sustainability for multiple products here on earth, be that recyclable plastics from non-oil-based sources or the production of uh, pharmaceuticals via biological means rather than chemical means. Plant science, so fast growth, zero waste plants I've talked about but also plants as sensors. So using the biology of plants and understanding that to really optimize their management, as well as transforming soil. So we have a, a goal that is about how we can take regolith, for instance, and make it into a, a source that can be used for the production of plants, but also equally, this can be applied here on earth through the same kinds of technologies for the remediation of plants. Um, the soils to grow plants. Plant-based nutrition, I've talked about the goal of having plants as an ultimate source of nutrition. And we're using a base material here of the wolfia and lemna duckweeds, which are a very interesting plant. They are the quickest growing uh, edible plant on the planet. They have an extremely good nutritional profile. They have a very high protein content. In fact, if you base it in a vertical farming scenario, they can produce 60 times the amount of protein that you can get from soya bean over the same amount of time. So it's a, a very fast growing, high nutrition crop, which we're optimizing for these environments, but also for production systems too. And that can be a baseline material, as well as working with optimizing other plants to grow in controlled environments. We'll be processing these into various foods, flavors and textures for, for both earth-based nutrition in various sectors. So improving plant-based foods with that variety that is required. I've also talked about biomanufacturing and the importance of this sector. This is a sector that's gonna grow predicted between well, four and 30 US trillion dollars by 2030. So there's a massive growth in that industry over the next few years. And that's the production of all kinds of pharmaceuticals or high value materials in biological systems, including plants. And using the high metabolism of plants, particularly through the terpenoid pathways, we can make a variety of products quite quickly and easily compared to yeast and certain bacteria. We'll also be looking at uh, producing from plant material and refining uh, various products. And so the processing is very important, miniaturizing this for space, but also scaling it up for earth uses. And the last thing is that psychology piece. And I talked about that. We know about but through COVID, for instance, the, the going back to nature that many of us uh, experienced, growing our own food again. And this is something that the astronauts get a lot of psychological support for in space, but also can be something that uh, we work on here on Earth and expanding urban agriculture and the like. Obviously, our role here is one in connectivity, and you saw all of our partners, and many of our partners reached out and it was a very easy collaboration to put together in this regard because 
of the enormity of this task and the ability to make synergies between these many groups rather than the recognition of us all needing to compete against each other and wasting a lot of effort in that. So we, we have this collaboration that allows us to gain our synergies from these top institutes around the world and really act as a, a nucleus for expanding the collaborations beyond what we have currently and making some real impact here over the next decade. I've talked about outreach and I've talked about recruitment. This is an area of science. I've been working in drought and salinity tolerance in crop plants for many years and made a lot of gains in this area. We have a number of crops with our innovations out in the field already. You go into schools, you go into uh, you interact with journalists and you know you get a mild uptake here. You talk about space and eyes light up, particularly in the classroom. So this is an extremely good engagement tool and one where children run the class, they can get them engaged initially in a subject and then move on to, to content that you want to deliver. It's also an extremely good tool for recruitment for really good students into this area. And we're seeing this in the sector already with a massive recruitment um, that is going to be underway and a lot of interest in that um, going forward. So talking a little bit about preparing the next generation and, and the people that we have in our programs and what a large centre like this helps us deliver to engage with multiple people um, across the, uh, the global scene here is we'll be delivering not a standard suite of masters and PhD programs. We'll be making sure that obviously we have equity and diversity, at the heart of our recruitment, that each and every member of our team will have their individual training program. And that's from our undergraduate students all the way through PhD to our permanent staff members as well. We have mentorship, we have industry experience embedded in all of our programs. So the ability of our students to work hand in hand with industry to solve particular issues or also just um, internships in related uh, fields as well. So this is a major part of what we're doing and something that will not just be in Australia, but will be global as well. So the ability of our students, some 400 members over the life of the centre will be our research complement. So we're talking a very large sector of um, research experience there. Entrepreneurship is something that we are very keen to give our students, give our staff exposure to. And obviously we have targets for interaction and spinning out IP that we'll generate in the sector with, um, with obviously licensing options, but also spin out options as well. And we're already negotiating and uh, very interested in, in finding out opportunities there for some IP that we have that um, could be taken up almost immediately. Outreach is a big part, and I've talked about that engagement of the next generation to get this pipeline of students. And each and every one of our staff and students will be involved in engagement throughout our programs. So let's talk about our alignment with some international goals and some Australian specific goals. I've obviously talked about space quite a bit here, and we have targets in Australia. In fact, they've been recently updated. We have a small, relatively small footprint in space, but one is, that is rapidly expanding. Uh, we are targeting 30,000 jobs in the sector by 2030 in a $12 billion industry. However, the alignment to obviously the global space industry is very important here. And that is a much larger opportunity, as you all know about, I'm sure, on this call. And with our international links and working on global issues here, then we certainly feed into that. Australian agriculture is a massive part of our economy. We will be obviously feeding into that aligned to the controlled environment, agriculture sector, particularly in protected cropping, which is an area that is growing rapidly, especially as we develop these new crop forms that can be grown successfully for high value production 
So going well beyond the traditional microgreens and lettuce that are traditionally grown in these um, environments, but moving the uh, platform forward significantly. And global biomanufacturing, I've already talked about that as a key growth opportunity, and we're certainly aligning with that. And already we have several targets that we're working on to produce in plants more efficiently than other um, biomanufacturing platforms such as yeast and bacteria. This aligns with all these industries that I've talked about. So food development, particularly education, agriculture, as well as the space sector. And I've already talked about our complement of people. So we're gonna have 400 researchers that um, will populate our, our center over the lifetime. So over the, the seven to 10 years. We will also be engaging, and that doesn't include the undergraduate students, I must um, point out, but that is the complement of higher degree res uh, researchers and staff. And it's really about stoking the pipeline here for the industries of the future. So with this network and with this multidisciplinary skill base that we have, we're looking to engage um, and bring value to our existing partners, but also to engage in new opportunities. And we're certainly not a closed shop, so we're welcome to discuss new ventures and collaboration, and please um, get in touch with myself to, to discuss that. And uh, looking forward to those discussions going forward. So just in summary, I'd like to highlight some of the areas uh, that I um, I've talked about today before I end this presentation. So Plants for Space is an Australian-based virtual centre linking expertise from around the world. We are working on supporting the Artemis missions, so enabling humans to go well beyond where they have before and, and to catalyse, uh, if you like, a new dawn in, in civilization, just as the moon landings did. We are working on biological solutions for space. So there has been tremendous investment in engineering solutions for space. The biological solutions, if we are really to take humans further than they have ever gone before in space, we need to work on biological solutions and really evolve or, or revolutionize those uh, to, to feed into the, the Artemis programs. Now there's been a catalog of innovations, over 2000 listed on the, the NASA spin-offs um, uh, technical data sheets that have come from space programs. And these have been really, uh, some of them by, by happenstance. So they have been developed such as iPhone cameras or anti-corrosion um, paint, laser eye surgery, etc., insulin pumps. These weren't intentional um, spin-offs. However, we are targeting certain areas such as high efficiency agriculture and biomanufacturing and plant-based solutions for health and well-being that will clearly spawn innovations that we can take up here on Earth. And we have those dual goals. We are not just working on supporting the space missions. We're working on developing these technologies that can spin off here on Earth. And we have these innovative public engagement tools. I haven't really spoken about them in depth, but these are experiences that we take into the classroom, like 3D printed plant foods or growth boxes that students can engage with across um, both the country and the, and the world. And we're also working on developing this industry from a very um, fundamental level pulling through these technological advances to uh, industry readiness levels that can be taken up and implemented. So that's the end of my presentation. It's been a, a pleasure presenting to you. And if um, there are some cool um, questions on the call, I'm happy to take them up, but I'll end my presentation here uh, with some words of JFK that resonate quite, uh, quite well here. This is an extremely difficult um, problem to tackle, but one that will give us great benefits here on Earth. So thank you for your attention. So some great. Thank you, Matt. And I do have a, a few follow up questions for you. Uh, I love the fact that you mentioned duckweed because it is such an efficient 
plants and, and certainly from a protein makeup, it's incredible. And there are startups here on earth that are actually working on duckweed as a potential ingredient, plant-based ingredient that can be an alternative to the likes of soy, wheat, and other types of plant-based protein. Uh, related to that is in space, when we think about uh, some of the challenges, biological plants is just tough overall. Um, are, are there thoughts or potential research around fermentation uh, capabilities? So when we think about fermentation, it could be microbiome bacteria base, for instance, that can uh, more efficiently grow protein, for instance, including cell base or culture meat, for instance. A any thoughts around that? Yeah, absolutely. So I have given a, a very biased um, presentation today. I'm a plant scientist. Plants will be um, a very important part of the solution, but they're not going to be the only part, particularly related to this uh, waste question that I've been talking about. So the goal of zero waste plants is is going to be a difficult one to achieve, not so much with duckweed, for instance, which essentially is already a zero waste plant because you can eat all of it or certainly process the very minimal root system if you're using those particular uh, species into uh, different food products. So you're more than likely going to need to ferment or, or degrade your, your plant material. The reason that we're working with plants, one is I mentioned the higher metabolism, but also secondly, because for all of these other biological organisms, be them yeast or bacteria, you have to give them a sugar carbon source to grow. And that will come from plants, inevitably. So we're cutting out the middleman here. However, absolutely fermentation technologies will, take their, will have their place for some things that are easier to do that way. Um, and, and bacteria, um, whether that's fermentation or, or, or otherwise production systems that way. So um, in answer to your question, Absolutely, both are required. However, there needs to be a concentrated effort on the plants area because that is the least developed of all of the areas so far. Mm -hmm. Now, specific in the context of Australia, Australia is a major exporter of agriculture, wheat, for instance. And of course, Australia has been hit with a very volatile, let's say climate to say the least. How is your work going to directly impact and help the agricultural sector within Australia? The kinds of things that we're working on will never completely replace broad acre agriculture, will never replace um, livestock, um, broad livestock farming. However, there are certain market areas where it competes very well, especially when linked with renewable fuel sources such as solar power, having the ability to sustainably produce product, particularly of high values initially, close to market in a way that is protected from the climate makes a lot of sense. And the, the numbers are starting to stack up when done, as I say, with renewable power sources and the like. So for high value products, there will be uh, the ability to deliver those close to market, and it will complement traditional agriculture. Terrific. Now, right now, I, I, as far as I'm aware, the more immediacy is to do experiments within the International Space Station, which of course is already expected to decommission at some point. But that is a very scarce commodity in terms of space. Uh, they're already constrained in terms of uh, astronauts relative to the kind of experiments that they can do. And they're so jam packed in there with payloads that it's just hard for them to even unpack the payloads to do the experiments. Can you talk about dependency of some of the R and D uh, that needs to happen mm -hmm. based on the need for capacity and availability? For instance, we don't know exactly for sure the reality of when private space stations are going to really open up moon base as well as space assets that's going to allow for those, these uh, experiments to be conducted. That's right. So we are um, in discussion with the, uh, some of the um, private companies that will be taking over the, the ability to service low Earth orbit. 
uh, when the space station is decommissioned. And one of our foundational partners is Axiom, and you probably saw that on the slide. So we are very much in discussion with them about what a science platform could look like on the space station, particularly in regard to plants. And that will help facilitate experiments that we have not been able to previously conduct. Because as you said, astronauts are very busy. They spend a lot of time fixing the space station currently. Um, and in the future, with uh, the commercial space sector really ramping up, the types of people that go to space won't just be career astronauts. They'll also be scientists or various other professionals that can conduct these kinds of experiments. We're, we're looking at automated platforms as well that take that demand out of um, for human interaction for, for many experiments. So that dual approach of experts going in, but also automating them thoroughly in um, extremely good platforms will help us to uh, deliver um, more experimentation that's required. So the final question, and it's coming from Tiffany on live stream, is, is duckweed feasible to turn into a biofuel? Yeah, that's a very good question. There's been some work on that. In fact, quite a lot of investment through the Department of Energy in the States, um, particularly through Woods Hole, that have been working on that as a commodity. We are not going to be working on that. And they um, there have been assessments, and it certainly looks a lot more favorable than uh, algal systems and there's been a lot of investment in algae but the economics of algae as a biofuel simply don't stack up the same constraints the the requirement to constantly agitate the requirement to put a lot of energy into break cell walls aren't there for duckweed they're a lot easier to break down so it looks like it is possibly a, a favorable source for biofuels clearly some more research needs to be done there but um, yeah, I think it's a more viable option. Great. Well, thank you, Matt. Let me hand the mic back to Sam. Thank you, Professor Gilliam. Please give him a round of applause. We will now transition to our longevity track. 